I insult so many people that I lose track of who I've insulted. I didn't, I, I, I didn't know that you... Yeah. All right, I know, I know this is kind of hard for you to see so far as specifics and all that, which isn't really all that important up here. Um, but this is like a December calendar, so I know we're still in November. We come back to school this day, Tuesday the 27th, okay? So Tuesday the 27th, a week from today, is when you're going to turn in your independent reading um, essay at 11.59 p.m., turnitin.com. It's your essay that we are going to talk about here in like three minutes, okay? So over break, you don't have an assignment that is due to me on like a Saturday, a Sunday. You don't have to come into class with a rough draft or anything like that, but... Uh, the day that you come back that evening, not the Monday before, but the evening of the 27th is when you would submit an essay. So in theory, Medina could take the whole break off, and then Tuesday night she could write her essay, and assuming she's read her book, and be okay. Some of you still need to finish reading your book because you haven't had to be there yet. Um, some of you will start working on your essay a little bit and whatnot. But, you know, it's 11.59 p.m. Tuesday that we come back when you'd be submitting your essay to turnin.com. On that same Tuesday is when you're going to get a um, copy of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which is going to be the next book that we read together as a class. So once you submit this essay on the, on the 27th, you're done with independent reading for the time being. You'll turn your books back into the old Wednesday and all that kind of stuff. On Tuesday, you're going to get a copy of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. You're going to have a reading check quiz for the first uh, couple parts of One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest on Thursday the 6th. So you'll get the book on Tuesday. You're going to read it to Thursday the 6th. You're going to need some time because it's about 200 pages. Okay, it's a, it's a good read. I think you'll enjoy it for the most part. But you know, it's it's a substantial amount of pages that you're reading. Your synthesis essay, remember, is then down here on December the 9th. So the essay that we've been working on, that you were checking in for your rough draft, that final copy is going to be December the 9th. So the idea is independent reading essay due when we come back. You get one flew over the cuckoo's nest. You can hopefully primarily focus on one flew over the cuckoo's nest from here. Then that gives you a few days to hopefully finish up your synthesis essay, and then you'll be finishing one flew over the cuckoo's nest for the 14th. Your second half of the read of Cuckoo's Nest is shorter than the first part. So the first part, you kind of get hit a little bit harder with it. Um, after you have that read, then you can finish off synthesis and then have time to finish off. And then the scary thing is by December the 21st, you're done with your school year for the 2018 portion because we come back in January. All right. So December is in a lot of ways like November. There's more days. But it's still pretty quick because you basically end up looking at, you know, about three weeks worth of December stuff that's just going on. Okay. So any questions? And really, in, in all honesty, the, there's not any other take-home assignments other than reading or working on those two essays. We'll be doing some multiple choice stuff in class. We'll be doing some other, like, TWA practice stuff in class. We'll do a TWA essay for the Cuckoo's Nest. We'll still have our literary term quiz and all that kind of thing. But you know those are pretty much your December assignments, independent reading and the November, and then it's reading Cuckoo's Nest and finishing off synthesis. So I really wanted you to have your synthesis not done, but I really wanted you to have a rough draft, good to go yesterday, so that you had ample time to work on your reading that we'll be doing, and then kind of just finish off the essay as you need. Um, over break, then in December, over winter break, is when you'll be reading your other independent reading book. Okay. Hey, it'll be shorter yeah. probably than The Jungle. So. Yes. So that'll be a Sunday night, 11.59 p.m. So that when you come in on Monday, you can be like, yay, I'm done. I don't, I don't have to worry about that. I'm sorry? All right, now, on uh, page 24 of your course syllabus is where the independent reading stuff is at. So this is taking a look at those essay prompts, numbers 3, 4, um, 5, and 6. Ultimately, what you are doing is you are choosing one of those four essays to write about. A couple things about the essay, just so there's not any confusion with it. You're writing one. <laughs> You're writing about the entire book. 
you're not just writing about like the second half, but you are important. You're basically covering the book the way that we were doing with like, you know, Steinbeck, uh, Great to Wrap Essay, and all that. Also, if um, if Heath ends up doing essay number three, and you know that you have another independent reading essay that you're going to do, like because you're going to do a second book. If Heath does number three for the jungle, and then he takes 1984, he could still do essay number three for that book. So I don't want you feeling like, ah, I don't know if I want to do this essay for this book. I might want to do it for a different book. You could write both essays of number five, number six, number three, whatever the case, whatever the case may be. For a second independent reading book, do we have to do the journal? Nope. So the, what's going to happen with the second one is you're going to have the book over break. You're going to read it. When you come back, you'll have about a week to do one of these essays. So it'll be a one, one shot and done. All right. Um, so a couple things with it. You know the essay is going to be due on Tuesday, November the 27th, 11.59 p.m. So you can come back you know, to school, ask a quick question if you need, and, and finalize some stuff and submit. This is a formal essay, so it's not a journal. So the score, the grading, is going to be on that one to nine scale. So, you know, when you get your independent reading, your second independent reading journal back for me, and I hope to have them in by Friday at the very latest, I might have a comment on there where I, I see what you're doing here with this use of motif. Uh, your examples are good. The, the explanation doesn't quite work the way you want it to. If this were a formal essay, it might kind of hurt your score a little bit. Independent reading journal 25 out of 25. So you could have like a 24, 25 out of 25 on a journal, but that doesn't mean it's an 8 to 9 quality essay. You know, I might leave some notes about you would want to kind of tighten this up and should it be a formal response. So for this essay that you're doing, you know, you could have a score of a 6 plus, 7 minus, you could have a score of a 9. Um, but it's not going to be simply a 24 out of 25 or, or anything along those lines. There we go. Um, the minimum would be that you will have three body paragraphs. Within each of those three body paragraphs, you would have two quotations. And you would have at least an additional citation. If you wanted to make three quotations, you could do that. So grand total number of examples coming throughout the book in your essay is going to be nine. What's the follow-up question then that people have in regards to your journals? And can you use those quotes again? Yeah, yeah. How many names are fair number? Two. 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 Not three. Five. Two. I was thinking, Nine. Like, I was thinking like ten. You can reuse two. Okay. Now, if, like, say Nina used imagery in her journal, she can certainly reuse imagery and do like all new examples of imagery. You could reuse devices if you end up talking about devices. But of, of the quotes that you pulled from, you can reuse two of them. Or of the examples you pulled from, I should say. You could reuse two of them if you want. But you are looking at, again, remember, the entire book. You don't want to just be taking a look at the second half or anything like that. If there are paragraphs the kind of that folks tend to struggle with with this essay specifically, I think it tends to be the introduction and the conclusion. So make sure you pay attention to these two paragraphs. I think the reason that people might struggle with them is because we don't put as much emphasis on them when it comes to the to the journals themselves. We just kind of do a quick, you know, three sentence intro, three sentence conclusion. This is more formal essay, so you know we're not looking at the 500 word count. So make sure you have your fog, you transition into the book, you can do your background. Remember, on pages like 21, 22, 23, you have essay structure checklists. Those would be things to maybe take a look at for this essay assignment, because you haven't done a take-home formal essay since yeah, yeah there is a wrap. You know, it's like September. It's been two months. Now you've certainly done writing, um, and I know you can certainly do it. But you haven't gone through that kind of formal um, writing assignment since then. It seemed, with the Grapes of Wrath, and I'm not throwing this out as a requirement, but it seemed that that 1,200 to 1,300 was the magic word count where the higher end essays kind of tended to be sitting there. So again, that's not going, you have to write at least that number of words. 
but I'm guessing that's probably where you want to be. Now, if you're heat for grant, you're already throwing out a thousand words for a journal. It's not adding that much more. If you were sitting at 640 for your journal, then yeah, you're probably going to about double it up. You know, for the most part. I'm not complaining about it. So, not not talking about the prompts, but any questions. Oh, and the, the other thing also would be remember to be verbs. Now, this doesn't change from what we were doing with the journals, but for a clarification standpoint, with the two two the two be verbs, two verbs verbs or whatever. None in the intro or the conclusion, and then within the first last sentences of your body paragraphs. So no change with what we were doing with the journals. Um, I've probably read maybe half of the journals at this point. I think the scores are a little higher compared to the first set for the simple type of people are more cognizant of the two people. So I think that was, you know, being good sign. So any question about, like, structurally what has to be there and all that kind of stuff? A little odd thing. All right. So what I wanted to do then is take a look at the four options that you have and hopefully kind of clarify any questions that there, there might be. Um, Yes. Have a, well, I'm glad you said that. Have a works cited page for your book. And I could see a fair number of you having a works cited page with something dealing with your author. Um, because a lot of these questions deal with like significance to the work as a whole kind of thing. Um, you know, with uh, Conrad, with Salinger coming up with Ken Kesey, we go over background stuff of the author so you're a little more aware of it. We didn't really do that with your authors. Um, so, you know, if you're reading something like The Stranger, it might be important to know that your author is an atheist who doesn't believe in any kind of like afterlife. Um, if you're reading A Farewell to Arms, which none of you are, oh, it would yeah. still be important to know some background about Hemingway and him being an ambulance driver and medic during World War One. So I could certainly see some citations for Sinclair or, well, Twain kind of showing up uh, because that could help kind of validate what an author is trying to, to get across. But uh, yeah, and if you do anything, you know, so for a book attention grab or whatnot, but yes, definitely have your book. Prompt number three. I don't mean this to sound demeaning in any kind of way. I would say this is probably the safe choice. Um, and the idea is that all of these essays can work with any of the books that you have. Eventually it'll pop in here, hopefully. Um, but slowly. Some novels and plays seem to advocate changes in social or political attitudes or in traditions. Choose such a novel and note briefly the particular attitudes or traditions that the author apparently wishes to modify. Then analyze the techniques the author uses to influence the reader or audience views avoid plot summary. Obviously this isn't going to highlight since we're not doing whatever, but when you see analyze the techniques the author uses, that lets you know right away what kind of essay are you looking at. It's a rhetorical analysis. So you would be finding three rhetorical devices since you're having three body paragraphs, analyzing how those rhetorical devices are used. It does tell you a little bit of the argument the social, political, some kind of cultural value tradition that the author wishes to modify. So your argument has to have something about a modification of a value of a tradition that you want to get across. So yeah, like political, you know, um, you know, if you're doing the awakening, certainly the way that, that women are treated or presented within society, Japan would be trying to, to monitor. I don't call number three the safe choice because you're going to you know, get a lower score on it because it's quote unquote the easy essay. It's safer in the sense that you have written that type of essay before. Number three is the only one that's strictly rhetorical analysis. There's not a synthesis, there's not a DRQ on the list. The other three essays are just other types of writing assignments. 
I wanted to give you some options outside of the AP realm because it gets kind of boring if you only do rhetorical analysis, DRQ, synthesis. Um, but you might want to write those since that's what you know how to do. So that could be an option for you if you want. Uh, this is for your journal, you remember? Symbolism and details? Yeah. Okay. So he could do details and symbolism again. Now you'd have to have a third option. What you can't do is plagiarize yourself and take your first journal, add a couple quotes, and do a third paragraph. Draft. Now, dependent upon the argument that you went with in that journal, it could be similar to what this is, and that could just be by, by circumstance. Um, but remember, you're pulling from the whole entire thing, so whole novel, three devices over. Just make sure the argument that you go with, you're dealing with something that the author, um, you know, wishes to modify to make the audience aware of. Any questions about number three? Okay. Number four. Writers often highlight the values of a culture or society by using characters who are alienated from that culture or society because of gender, race, class, or creed. Choose a novel in which such a character plays a significant role and show how that character's alienation reveals the surrounding society's assumptions or moral values. So you are going to pick a character that has a significant role, explain how that character is alienated, and then the significance part what does that alienation reveal about the surrounding society's assumptions or moral values? One thing to definitely understand about this one is I want you to choose one character. So build the whole thing around Yorgos or Winston or Julia or Edna or Jim or Huck or you know, whomever else you end up going with. Don't do a couple different types of alienation for different types of characters. It'd be hard to... Okay. So structurally, we're going to figure out how do we go about setting this one up. Um, I would say reveals the surrounding society's assumptions or moral values. That's probably going to be your last body paragraph. All right. So this is one where you would then kind of incorporate your author. This is where knowing some background of your author would probably come in handy, be helpful, be useful. It'd be very similar to what you were doing with the um, uh, Catcher in the Rye, what's Salinger's purpose with the madness that Holden's going through. Now, this is where it gets kind of messy because there's so many different books that are out there and, and different ways that you could set it up. But I would think you would want to have two paragraphs that pretty much deal with this character and how he ends up being alienated. Um, dependent upon the book, you could be looking at something where um, Megan and Nina, you guys are doing Awakening, correct? I think a couple others are, you know, as well. Um, where you could look how a character is alienated by multiple people or multiple groups. So they might be looking at how she's alienated by her husband, and then could be doing more like a social alienation in the second body paragraph. Um, you could look like for 1984, you could take a look at maybe in the way in which Winston decides to alienate or isolate himself, and then from a plot standpoint, how that maybe leads to further alienation later on throughout the course of the book. Um, and, and I think folks who are doing Gatsby, depending who you choose, again, it could be a plot thing, it could be types of alienation, there could be physical alienation and then emotional alienation, how different characters are choosing to alienate the character. Um, but that's going to vary from person to person. Your two body, your first two body paragraphs, your first six examples are basically validating this is how that character feels. The third body paragraph, this is why it's important. Those three quotes in the third body paragraph, or those three examples, might not tie in directly to how a character is alienated, but this would be more how does that alienation help reveal the argument you could be quoting things or citing things that are validating. This is what Orwell wants to get across to the reader. You explain how the alienation helps that. Um, and I, I think that's where you kind of start to have some maturity with the examples that get used, where you're not just looking for quotes of the rhetorical device or specific alienation, but quotes that could be validating the argument. Um, if he does symbolism again, 
he might have two symbols. He might have one symbol that he uses, has a couple examples of that symbol. His third example in that paragraph could be something dealing with this is what Sinclair wants to modify, and this is how that symbol helps do it. So I don't want you thinking that your quotes have to be always rhetorical devices, always have to be the main concept that's getting presented. It could be helping to validate what the author's trying to get across. Subtle details that maybe don't seem all that significant, but when you put it in the big picture, they start to kind of resonate a little bit more. Um, so I'd say you'll probably have about six, roughly six alienation examples, and then three examples that are going to be more with, here's what Oral wants to get across, Sinclair, Twain, Camus, Cheryl, you know, Chopin, whomever. But depending upon the book, the way the character gets alienated certainly could vary. You don't have to pick the main character, you know, so go with Ona if you want, or, you know, Maria, um, but you have to pick the same character. You're not going to go Jorgis, Ona, Maria, and all that kind of thing. I think alienation is pretty clear in your books. The big thing is going to be, well, what's that reveal about the society's assumptions that, that you'll have to figure out? Any questions for alienation? Just thinking about something. Right. Going, do I want the stuffing in the bird or out the bird? Well, the, the gelatin, like in the can, or do I want fresh? No, no, you make it yourself. You're going to go fresh with cherries in it. Number five. I think number five has the potential to be a really good essay. I think number five scares people off from time to time. I definitely think number five would apply to all the books. Um, British novelist Faye Weldon offers this observation about happy endings. Uh, the writers, I do believe, who get the best, the most lasting response from their readers are writers who offer a happy ending through a moral development. By a happy ending, I don't mean mere fortune events, a marriage, or a last-minute rescue from death, but some kind of spiritual reassessment or moral reconciliation with the self, even at death. Choose a novel that has the kind of ending that Weldon describes in a well-written essay. Identify the spiritual reassessment or moral reconciliation evident in the ending and explain its significance in the work as a whole. That's what? Tale of Two Cities. Yeah. Pretty much every book is like 10th grade. And 11th grade. And 12th grade. Now, a concern. You want to guess a concern that people have about their quotes? Concern that folks have is, well, aren't all my quotes going to be coming from the end of the book because I have to be dealing with the ending and you want me to spread out my evidence, my examples? Well, for Weldon, what is a happy ending? So there is some kind of change that takes place. So if you are highlighting the change, you kind of have to give us examples of what the character was before. And then you're going to give us examples of what the character was like after. And that's probably going to be, you know, two body paragraphs. So you're going to have a paragraph where you're dealing with maybe the beginning slash middle of the book. Then you'll have a paragraph that's dealing with the end of the book so that we can see what that change is that occurs. That's two body paragraphs. What do I have to do in that third? Explain the significance to the work as a whole. What, why is it a big deal? What's the significance about this change that takes place? You have that paragraph. So kind of like how number four has the significance for the surrounding society's assumptions or moral values, this one also has that significance paragraph. But you're probably, I mean, you certainly would have at least three examples about the character toward the latter parts of the book. But that first body paragraph, I still need to touch on what Winston was like, or what Jorgis was like, or what Rousseau was like, or Edna, and all those kinds of things at the beginning, middle of the book. Then I'll highlight this is a change that took place. I've told you the change, but haven't explained the change. Now that explanation is going to be offered in a significant part in that last body paragraph. And similar to the alienation, those quotes that you could be using in that third part, how does this change signify what the author So you could have a character who dies, you know, even at death. 
but that doesn't have to be a part of the end of the book in order to use prompt number five. Prompt number five is a pretty sophisticated one, um, but it's probably, I would say, of the four, the one that is the lowest percentage of them. Still, certainly a fair number of people do, but probably at least least popular. He's trying to figure out the calculation of percentages of sure. the new plot. What's the uh, what's the whisper thing? Yeah. I swear we never did those in high school. It's like a new thing. Whatever. We did them in like Yeah, we did them a little bit. Now, you don't you don't have to explain why this moral reconciliation is happy, but you're simply going to kind of probably use Weldon as a little bit of part of your attention grabber that this is significant. And then take a look at what that kind, what kind of ending, what kind of development ends up happening with uh, with your book. Number six is not rhetorical analysis or D or Q, but I would say kind of like number three, it's a safe one. I think it's one that people tend to grasp pretty easily, and it has a nice structure to it. Um, from a novel, choose a character; doesn't have to be the protagonist whose mind is pulled in conflicting directions by two compelling desires. Ambitions, obligations, influences, two forces, essentially. Then in a well-organized essay, identify each of the two conflicting forces and explain how this conflict with one character, there it is, illuminates the meaning to the work as a whole. Again, you have to choose one character. It doesn't have to be the main character, but it would have to be a prominent character. But I think the structure for this one's pretty straightforward. I have one desire. That's going to be explained in a paragraph. I have another desire. That's going to be in a paragraph. And then I have the significance of that desire in a paragraph. And then I got my three. Good to go. Over the years, mentioned to you intro conclusions sometimes get a little bit of the, the short end of the stick. Make sure you develop those. For whatever reason, people forget in their significance paragraph, if you're doing prompts uh, four, five, or six, don't forget your quotes slash examples. Sometimes people have nice essays. I got my three examples. I have my three examples. Here's the significance. It makes sense, but there's not any validation of it. Um, so make sure you, you do that, that you include those quotes, those examples. And anytime you get into the significance, meaning of the work as a whole, don't forget to include the author. You know, so what is it that Orwell is trying to get the author, the reader, excuse me, to understand? What Chopin, what does she want to have resonate with the audience of the book um, to better understand after reading about the conflicts that Edna's facing and all that kind of stuff? So make sure that your argument with that significance is this is why it matters to Orwell, this is why it matters to Sinclair, this is why it matters to Twain and all that stuff. Um, all of the essays are certainly options for all of the books. The hope is by the time you're done, you kind of go, I think number four would work really well, or number 385, or, or six. Don't write all four of them once. I'm not reading them all. Did you pick the best one? You pick which one will be the best one for you to pick. That's what you'll always go to. Uh, oh, remember, you have your syllabus that has some essay structure stuff that could be useful for you to look at. It has your list of like dead words and whatnot. You can certainly email me um, or, or shoot me a text over break. It might not be an immediate response, but I'll, I'll check that stuff. Um, and then I would say by Friday is when you should notice the power school that your journals are there. Maybe then available at that point on Turnitin. So you can take a look at them um, and see if there's any like, kind of like last minute commentary or, or comments that would be useful for you when it comes to this essay assignment. But it's Tuesday night, 27th is when you submit. It's not a Monday night. I'll get it available early if you want. So if you want to submit it Monday night and you don't worry about anything for that week, that's, that's perfectly fine. But Tuesday night would be the only day for it. And we'll come back to the book. Is it as good as catch them I, I don't, yes. I, I, I would say yes. I'm trying to think, in a sense, where people write. People generally like it. Um, I don't know which would be more popular. Catch, catch in their eyes, I'd say, easier.
easier to read because it's more informal. Um, they're both similar to you have an unreliable narrator with some um, mental instabilities. Chief's a little harder to follow, I would say, than, than Holden is. Chief's not annoying in the way that, you know, I think some people find Holden to be. Chief's problem. Chief Robbins, a six foot seven Native American who can't talk, can't care. Well, makes for a really good narrator. And then he has flashbacks to World War II in his childhood. Because he gets electricity shot through his system. Have a good break.